Howdy. We're here today with Mike Parham of Contributed Systems. Uh, also, you're probably more familiar with Sidekick and uh, Inspector, his main projects. And we wanted to kind of talk about some of the things that he's done to get started, uh, starting out with an open source project and actually making a living off of it, a pretty healthy living, no less. Uh, welcome, Mike. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Um, so real quick, just to kind of get some background history and context, can you talk a little bit about um, summarize your career in 30 seconds and then how that translated into uh, what you're doing now? Sure. Well, I've been a, a developer, an engineer for the last almost 20 years now, um, and I've done open source for almost all that time also. I just sort of naturally gravitated toward it. Open source is great because it allows engineers to scratch their own itch. If they've got a problem, they can just find some code that solves that problem. So uh, I, as part of my job in building various businesses, I just naturally started contributing to open source and found myself really enjoying it. And, uh, and so as I moved into the Ruby community and the Rails community, I naturally picked up some Ruby projects and worked on those and then started creating my own projects. And so that sort of led me to where I am today. Okay. So Sidekick didn't start out with the intention of being a business. It was just a project, and then you kind of realized there was opportunity there. How, what, what kind of timeline did that, how long were you working on it before you kind of started to think that, oh, hey, this could be a business? Well, as a, a longtime open source developer, I knew that um, it was quite frequent. I, I knew that Sidekick was going to be a uh, on the large side of mm -hmm. uh, a single person projects. Mm -hmm. And so I knew that I was going to have to dedicate a lot of time to it to make it work. Yeah. And I said, uh, I don't want to dedicate thousands of hours to build something that meets my vision only to make zero dollars off yeah. of it. That doesn't make any sense. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm an altruistic, nice person, but I'm not that altruistic. Yeah. Well, we all have to make a living. Exactly. So I, I, um, I started the project trying to solve this problem of you know, building a better background job framework. But at the same time, I also wanted to solve the problem of how can I make a little money off of this project also. And so that's where I started uh, the idea of selling licenses and then later moved to an open core model where I'm giving away uh, the core uh, sidekick job engine and then selling expansion packs that add more features onto it. So even when you created a business, did you anticipate it ever getting where it is now? Or was it more, Hey, this would be cool if it pays the rent. And it kind of just took off from there. I had a couple of dreams, a couple of goals when I first started, uh, that were sort of, if I achieve these, then I have, I have achieved exactly what I wanted um, one of those was to get three major Ruby companies as customers, companies like GitHub or yeah. Basecamp or New Relic. Uh, and I've achieved that. I've got uh, Heroku as a customer. I've got New Relic as a customer and then hundreds of other uh, uh, startups to Fortune 100 companies as uh, customers. I also wanted to make a million dollars over the course of five years, I thought that doesn't seem like that big of a, uh, an ask mm -hmm. considering how much value I'm, I'm assuming is going to be in this project. And, uh, and so I've passed that also now. And, uh, uh, the third one was to become the number one background job framework. So to pass rescue, to pass delayed job and become sort of the choice of the ecosystem. Yeah. Okay. So you, you feel pretty good then about where you're at relative to where you hope to, uh, to get. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've achieved what I wanted. Uh, now it's just a question of, you know, how much further can I take it? And yeah. I have no idea at this point, but, uh, you know, I'm, 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 it's a, it's a fun, it'll be a fun ride while it lasts. We'll how, see how long it goes for. How aspirational were those goals when you originally set them? Did you feel pretty good about them or were you kind of, eh, there's a 50, 50 shot here? Well, I knew that there was going to be a lot of value, um, within a month of, uh, releasing sidekick. I had people coming to me and telling me that they were saving thousands of dollars a month yeah. in, in server hosting costs. So I knew there's a lot of value in this yeah. thing. And then as you, uh, as, as companies start to jump onto sidekick, I knew that they would want additional functionality that they would want access to the expert at the system if they needed support. 
um, you know, think of it like insurance. Big, yeah. big businesses are willing to pay for insurance so that if they have a production problem, they can email me and get help within, a, you know, an hour or two. Yeah. So uh, I knew that there was going to be some amount of business here. I just didn't know how much, whether it was going to be full time, whether it was going to make me rich or whether I was just going to make, you know, a, a decent job out of it. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's just it's I've been pleasantly surprised at the uptake. Well, and it's it's clear that by you keep saying value, right? And for so many developers, it's so hard to think that way, right? It's what can I build, not what can provide value to companies. And uh, a lot of people I've talked to, too, um, that have been struggling to get their business off the ground, they haven't thought in terms of what value they're providing. And it's it makes a big, big difference because if you solve a problem for somebody, they're willing to pay to make that pain go away. And right. until you've created the business and you've been successful and you start thinking about problems that way, it's hard to think about it that way as the seller of the product. Right. They're, uh, bare metrics, the, uh, the Stripe metrics SAS, mm -hmm. they have a, a nice build versus buy calculator yep. on their site. Yep. And you can almost point people to that and say, listen, uh, what I sell through Sidekick, you can piece together yourself from a dozen different open source libraries. Uh, but it's going to take you maybe two, th two, three, four weeks to do it. Mm -hmm. Now, the alternative is you pay me $1,000 a year. <laughs> yeah, and it goes away. And so, you know, it, you know if you're paying your developer $10,000 a month for a senior developer, it, it makes perfect sense just to simply to buy my thing instead. It's just, it's, it's literally cheaper to do that. Yeah. Well, uh, so I, the value is easy to see when you express it in those terms. I think the hard part is so many of us have a consumer mentality where spending a thousand dollars on something is just spending a thousand dollars. Whereas from a business standpoint, spending a thousand dollars to save 10 or more is a no brainer. Uh, right. So that's a really good thing for people to, to kind of catch on to. Um, on that note, one of the other things I think a lot of people struggle with is spanning the chasm between open source and for profit, right? And from a cash flow standpoint, making a profit is how things stay sustainable. And so, did you ever struggle with that? And if not, do you have advice? Or even if you did struggle with it and now you're past, do you have kind of advice on how people can help? reframe that so they understand and they don't feel guilty trying to make money off of uh, open source or, or things like that. Yeah. The first six months to a year that I was selling Sidekick Pro, I was terrified. I mean, it's like trying to sell water to es or ice to Eskimos, right? You're trying to sell software to open source developers. Yeah. That's ter That's a terrifying <laughs> thing. Um, you know, thankfully this was a side project and so there wasn't a lot of risk to me. Uh, you know, I can only imagine the terror of someone trying to make it their full time job immediately. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, the, one of the beauties of open source is you can work on it as a side project and, and sell it as a side gig kind of thing. And certainly I, I recommend people do that if possible. Um, but, yes, it was terrifying. And um, what I had to do was you get a, you get a small amount of negative people, mm -hmm. but there were so many more people who were very positive because I went out of my way to explain, listen, here's the symptoms and here's look at every other open source project. They're a ghost town after two years mm -hmm. because the, the, the project maintainers just can't they burn out because they're not it's a, not a sustainable thing. Yeah, becomes... And so I have I have to charge money to make this sustainable. It's as simple as that. And so 90 percent of people realized that understood that were very positive about that. Um, you do get the 10 percent who are just simply entitled yeah. they want everything in the open source and and that's it and otherwise they're just gonna they're gonna neg you constantly um, but thankfully over time that's kind of died off people have realized this is really working um he he has been here for the long haul you know i've been working on this for almost five years now uh and with no plans to stop yeah well, and so many, I think so many successful open source projects uh, end up kind of collapsing under their own weight if they don't have either a company behind them or, you know, like Rails has obviously been successful because they have Basecamp behind right. them. And so there's things like that that, uh, that works. But for a smaller project that doesn't have that kind of backing without something to sustain it long term, it's right. just inevitable. Everybody's life changes. Even if you want to stay involved in it, just things change. 
the project reaches a stability point where mm -hmm. no one wants to change anything anymore. Everyone's terrified because then that requires extra work. Yeah. And so, and so you look at a, a project like rescue, um, and it just doesn't change much anymore because it's reached this point of stability. Yeah. Everybody knows what it is. Everybody knows how to do things with it. And so no one wants to, uh, to, to add any more features or functionality that might require more of their time. It's just, it is what it is. And that's, it's probably won't change anymore. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so kind of as an extension of that, how do you, What's your rule of thumb on deciding kind of what belongs in the, the core version versus what belongs in the paid version? Right. So uh, this is always a struggle. There's certainly a tension here. Um, people are constantly asking, hey, kid, why isn't this feature in, in the open source version? Uh, my rule of thumb is if 100% of people need it, then it should probably go into Sidekick, the, the core. If it's a if it's an integration piece that's going to be used by tons of people like rails five mm -hmm. rails five introduces this new way of code loading so that it's thread safe. Well, that's always been a limitation of sidekick in general is that you have to kill it and restart it to load uh, worker changes. Okay. And so that is an example of a feature where that's going to go into the open source version because everyone uses that. Mm -hmm. uh, but for more specialized features, and, and sort of harder features uh, to implement and to support, uh, those generally go into more of the paid tiers. Uh, let me give you an example of one that I just uh, started working on yesterday, uh, the web UI. So Sidekick's web UI uh, is nice to look at, uh, but it, it has no uh, authorization at all. If you can log into it, there's no way the company running the UI can say this user is or is not allowed to perform this particular yeah. action. So I can just go and I can delete a queue. If I can log into the Sidekick UI, I can delete a queue. And some some companies don't want to do that. They want to present a read-only view. Yeah. And so that's an example of where I'm pushing that into the enterprise version yep. because that's something that only really – you know, yeah. startups generally aren't going to care about that. They just, they want to give access to everybody because, you know, time is money and they just want to get stuff done. Yep. But something like a big enterprise where security is more of a concern, uh, that's a perfect example where uh, adding an authorization rule to the web UI is, is something that uh, they're very interested in and the money is almost secondary. Yeah, totally. From a, from a maintenance standpoint, does that drastically complicate things or is that something where as long as you know and plan for that, you've got the whole project is designed to specifically accommodate those scenarios? That, that's a, a great question also. Certainly, um, certainly ease of implementation also, <laughs> also very much controls sort of which layer it's going to go into. If, I, if a feature really can't be pushed into a paid tier, if, it simply, if the code simply has to reside in Sidekick proper, mm -hmm. then then it is what it is. I got to put it in Sidekick proper. Um, so all these sorts of implementation details also affect which layer am I going to put it in? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Um, so support everybody. I feel like this is another one of those questions that comes up a lot. And I know when I first started Sifter, I was scared of it too. And it was the original, one of the original reasons I didn't even want to create a paid app because mm -hmm. I didn't want to be obligated to do support. Um, how, how much time do you spend on support, uh, every day and kind of what's your process? And especially the bigger context I hear is people are thinking if I'm starting something as a side project, but I have a full-time job, am I going to have the bandwidth to manage support? And my experience and what I've heard talking to everybody has been generally, Either support will be all right and manageable, or it will be overwhelming because there's something wrong with the tool, in which case you have justification to fix it, or it'll be overwhelming because it's taking off and you can afford to spend more time on it. Does that correlate pretty closely? Well, you've got a couple, a couple advantages uh, when you're starting a project. One, it is open source, mm -hmm. which means you have no guarantees to anybody about any sort of level of support, right? Yeah. Uh, support with open source and free project is always best effort. If you mm -hmm. don't want to put any time into it, you don't have to. Um, number two is you can always give trusted lieutenants 
access to your project and and they will shoulder some amount of the support also. Mm -hmm. uh, when I have GitHub issues opened, um, you know, 75% of the time I'm the one who's answering them, but I also have occasionally other people dive in and say, oh, this is just, you need to do this, or, you know, this is a known issue or something like that, right? Where they are helping take a little bit of that burden off you just by virtue of being uh, a collaborator on mm -hmm. the project. The third thing is, uh, is once you actually start selling a commercial version, then you've got money that is paying for you to support your customers. Mm -hmm. And you can actually use support as a leverage to get people to pay for your product now. Um, you know, I, I tell people that if you are just using the free version, there's absolutely no guarantee of support. Yeah. I, I might be on vacation for the next two weeks, you know, you know, I, I always encourage people to go to Stack Overflow, uh, open a public GitHub issue so that uh, other people will see your issue and might jump in and help you also. Yeah, absolutely. But the only uh, people I guarantee support to are people that are actually paying me. So on, on that level too, support just kind of nicely, with open source at least, kind of scales with the transition upwards from open source project to paid project. And there's not any kind of terrible tension where it's this awkward phase of making enough money, but not making enough money and having to juggle it. I mean, there, there certainly is a point, there's a, there's a point where you're making a little bit of money, but not enough to work full time on it and where you'd need to use some of your spare time after hours, uh, yeah. weekends, maybe possibly. But you know, if you're making, uh, you know, 10,000 a year, 20,000 a year, uh, that's enough for a nice vacation. Maybe the nice vacation, uh, in return, you spend a few hours every weekend providing support. Yeah. That makes um, sense. and it also depends on, on sort of what sort of support contract are people buying when they pay for your stuff? Are they paying for 24 hours turnaround? Are they paying for three business days? Um, you know, it's up to you to set sort of expectations. And, and if you do set expectations to your customers, uh, they appreciate that kind of notice. So they know what to expect. Yeah. Um, you know, if you say I'll respond within 72 hours, then they know, Hey, I probably shouldn't expect a, res a response within 30 minutes. Yeah. Well, and I think that gets back to value, right? Like you can create, I don't know, do you have different tiers or is it just once you're paid, you get a week? Or I don't, a day or... I, I don't have different support tiers. Uh, it's just, uh, you know, email basically. Yeah. Um, pro and enterprise both get the same level of support, essentially. It, uh, the tiers are just differentiated based on, uh, features. But there's certainly a point too, where people could say they could offer, you know, 72 hours or 24 hours or whatever it is, and just simply charge more and understand that it's exchanging a value. Yeah. You're on the hook for better support, but you're getting, you know, getting paid well. So it's a, it's a judgment call. It's nice to have that level of control. There's many different dimensions by which you can price. And I certainly encourage people to think about their own situation and how can they differentiate different pricing tiers. Well, that was one of the things, uh, just talking to, uh, Pat Allen about, uh, flying Sphinx. He actually got a second little burner cell phone that was the phone that gets paged so that he could turn off his other phone when he wanted to turn it off and not feel guilty. Like he was going to miss a call. Um, but still you have to carry two phones, but you know, throw it in your laptop bag. Uh, so I think there's a lot of interesting things there to control your lifestyle, um, yeah. and help stay sane. Yeah. I specifically don't offer phone support yeah. <laughs> uh, because I don't want to have that. All my support is asynchronous only. Um, but I do differentiate in that, uh, my customers can email me, mm -hmm. whereas I don't allow my open source users yep. to email me. It's pri it's public uh, forums only. With it being something that's a tool that's self-hosted, self-installed, um, one of the nicest things about SaaS in general is being able to fix a bug, deploy it to everybody in minutes. Um, does do you find that that's made uh, support or troubleshooting much more difficult, or just marginally more difficult? Have you done a lot to kind of help um, make that easier on you? Most of my customers stay relatively current. Um, I'd say, you know, the, the majority of them, uh, I do hear occasionally from customers that are running like two years behind, right? They're still running sidekick two, uh, from, from two or three years ago on Ruby one nine or something like that. 
Um, but you know, my first response to them is simply, Hey, you're running a really old version. Uh, I'm not going to be able to support you very well here, uh, simply because I haven't even thought about that version in, in years. Um, but, uh, for the most part, people do stay relatively current and they do understand if they run into what they think is a sidekick bug, maybe they should do a bundle update, uh, to make sure that they've got the latest version. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, for the most part, it's, it's not that big of a deal. Okay. Uh, and the trade-off I'm more than willing to make is I'm not running a SAS that has 24 yep. seven uptime anymore. Yep. Uh, I do have a gym server that is, does have to run 24 seven. Um, but it's, it's so absurdly simple that, uh, it's Not very easy nice. to have, uh, you know, several nines of uptime. But I think that's one of the things I didn't think about it until long after I was running Sifter, but there's certainly a trade off there between, having it be distributed and self-hosted versus you're on the hook for everybody all the time. Right. And, you know, they both have their advantages and disadvantages, but, uh, I think if you kind of, again, if you optimize it for the life you want and you figure it out, then either option right. can work. So speaking of lifestyle, so your revenue to employee ratio is off the charts. Um, do you feel like that's the growth is getting to the point where it's a strain or have you been kind of optimizing the business as you go along so that you can continue to manage a bigger, you know, heavier load or, uh, and it, it is just you, right? Besides the other, contrib you know, open source contributors. Uh, how's that kind of been working as the company's been getting bigger? Uh, you're absolutely right. So contributed systems is a one man shop. Uh, and I have no plans to change that right now. Um, what I have done over the last few years is I've tried to optimize my business so that it is automated as much as possible, mm -hmm. that it will scale, uh, ideally sublinearly. So my workload does not scale linearly with my customers. Um, and, and part of that is, is support. So support is my main cost that I'm paying every single day. That's my, the, my main workload every day. And so part of what I've tried to do in building the product is, make the product as, as foolproof as possible, mm -hmm. make uh, the errors that it gives as, as simple to understand as possible. Uh, I've tried to make the code just as, as, as intelligent and as self-healing as I, as I can get it um, so that uh, I don't, so does to minimize people e emailing me support questions. Um, also along those lines, my wiki documentation, I try to make as, as extensive as possible. Um, one nice thing about selling to open source developers is even though they're not used to paying for software, they are used to solving their own problem. Yeah. So open source developers are very used to just going to Google and saying, I'm seeing this error message. What does it mean? Mm -hmm. And then they'll get a Stack Overflow answer or they'll get my wiki page that talks about it. Yeah. And so that way, that that uh, that's one less touch uh, via email for me. Mm hmm. So, uh, so yeah, I've, I've tried to minimize my support burden as much as possible. Um, and, and automate my business. So all my customer onboarding is on automated. Uh, my customer, uh, churn is also automated. So if they don't pay for the, if they don't re up their subscription that, uh, they automatically are removed. Mm -hmm. Their access is removed from the gym server. So all that's automated, um, which is nice. And, uh, all that's done through Stripe. So all the billing is all automated also. So I don't have to play, um, AR person and, yeah. and accounts receivable and, and contacting them and saying, Hey, you got to pay your bill, that sort of thing. Yeah. I don't, uh, I don't do any of that sort of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. No automation is so, and if nothing else, even if you want to grow, that automation is going to help make it easier to hire and to scale and to teach new people because you're not going to have to train them on a 20 step process of how to log in and do a refund or, you know, uh, right. whatever it is, uh, outside of the software itself, have you done a lot to automate like the business side? So your accounting, your bookkeeping, um, have you mm -hmm. outsourced all of that? Uh, how, did you kind of start trying to do it yourself or did you outsource it right away? That was actually one of the harder things uh, when I first started the business was uh, I, I needed to do bookkeeping and I had no idea how to do that. I had a friend who was a controller at my old company and so he actually came over a couple days and walked me through QuickBooks and just how to use it. 
So he, he set up my accounts. He showed me how to import bank transactions and sort of do all that sort of reconciliation. Uh, so I actually learned how to do that over the course of the first month of the business. And now that's sort of one of those daily tasks that I do is, you know, I get up, I, I do my, my accounting, I answer support emails, uh, I, I keep track of, of sales and, and payments and that sort of thing. And, uh, and that's just sort of part of my daily process now that has nothing to do with the actual technical stuff. Yeah. It has nothing to do with sidekick, it. It but that's just, time. yeah, that's part of running a business and, yeah. and everybody has to do that kind of thing. So that was kind of one of the most daunting things is just cause I was an engineer. I'd never run a business before. Uh, it took a, took a month or so to become comfortable with that kind of thing, but now it's just, it's second nature and, and I'm used to it. Yeah. I think that blindsides a lot of people. Uh, as well when they're getting started is you mean I don't just have to hit release and ship software there's more to it um well i mean you can it just depends on how serious you want to make the business right i mean yeah. you can always uh, you can always uh you know sell the software yourself you don't have the liability or you don't have the uh the limited liability and that sort of thing mm -hmm. uh, but um you know it depends on how how easy or how hard people want to make it for themselves yeah for sure um so now into kind of the touchy feely questions. What has been the most difficult, stressful single event or kind of period, um, through all of this that looking back on you are just don't know how you made it through, but now you kind of look back and smile and be like, wow, okay, I got this. Well, um, so my other product is called inspector mm -hmm. and it is designed to be a newer, more modern version of the monnet. Yep. Uh, monitoring utility that mm -hmm. a lot of if you're server side if you're a server side person a lot of people are familiar with that tool so i wrote a, a more modern version of it that i that i really wanted myself uh this was a tool that i'd wanted for yeah. for many years and so when i released it within a day the monet people uh hit me with a dmca takedown notice and actually shut down my my open source project uh, because they had said that i had copied their source code now, never mind the fact that monitor C and inspector is go mm -hmm. <laughs> or that I had written inspector from scratch and I had never actually looked at the monitor source code. Um, so I, I just, I tweeted that, Hey, uh, inspector has been shut down by the monitor people, um, accusing me of this copyright infringement and it blew up. It, it was on, it was the front page of the hacker news for hours, uh, hundreds of comments, uh, and, and people who knew me were, were supporting me. Evan Phoenix, uh, yeah. the guy who does Puma and Rubinius, he, uh, he had been there from day one. I had given him access to the private repo from day one. He had seen me dribble in commits every single day, just changing the code and learning Go and that sort of thing. So he knew that I had written all this and hadn't copied anything. Uh, so he supported me on, on Hacker News and a bunch of other people said, this, we know this guy. But uh, you know some other just haters came and said, oh, he probably did steal it. And, sort of stuff. Yeah. But that was, that was, uh, that was a hard day because I had spent three months building mm -hmm. this thing and almost immediately this project was threatened to be shut down and something I had to simply throw away. Like I would have lost the last three months of my life. Yeah. With having, no um, validity whatsoever. Yeah. I mean, there was nothing to it. Uh, and so what happened was, uh, they were in Norway and I'm in California or I'm in Oregon on the West coast. Uh, so by the time that I heard about it and told people about it, Norway was basically shutting down. Mm -hmm. And so the next day when Norway's day started, they saw all this brouhaha, they read all the stuff and the CEO emailed me immediately and basically said, you know, we apologize. We were, we were mistaken. You know, the fellow who told us this was wrong. And, uh, and so we, we asked uh, GitHub to reinstate everything. So it all went away overnight. But let me tell you, I didn't sleep very well. Terrible that 24 hours. Yeah. Yeah. And and so I would imagine that that is going to be the case for any sort of legal action people go through. You know, mm -hmm. the, the the law is so unpredictable. Having a third party who doesn't know anything about you or the other party kind of have to have to impartially judge things. You just never know how that's going to turn out. And so uh, sort of any sort of legal issue can be can be terrifying to uh, to contemplate. Oh, absolutely. Wow. <clears throat> okay. That's a big one. Um, if you could do anything all over again, would you 
do what you've done the same way you did it, or what would you change? Uh, the only big mistake that I made on day one was I didn't sell the software as a subscription. So you waited too I, long. To, to... I, I, well, I tried. I, I originally sold Sidekick Pro for a one-time fee. Uh, okay, so subscription versus and, one time. Exactly, yeah. and so what? What I found was that you know, after two or three or four years, you're still putting in features, you're still putting in bug fixes, you're still giving yeah. them support, but they're not paying you anything anymore. Mm-hmm. And so, I after about a year and a half of this, I switched to a subscription model. Yeah. Once I realized I actually wanted to make a business out of it, I realized I'm going to have to go to subscription. There's just not enough. I'm not. I'm not making enough sales. Uh, one time to sort of justify, um, yeah. make, I wouldn't be able to make this a full-time business. So, uh, when I switched to sub- subscription after a year and a half, then things got a lot better. And then I had much more predictable revenue. I had, um, you know, those, those annual resubscriptions coming in. And so that's, you know, that's some amount of revenue that you can predict and you know, is going to be, is, is going to be there. Yeah. So, uh, whereas with a one-time thing, you just don't know everybody that bought over the last four years, is anybody going to buy next month? I don't know. <laughs> no, it's... So that was my, that was my big mistake. Is yeah. Software is never done. Software always needs support, always needs bug fixes. Sell it as a subscription. Well, and, and businesses don't mind. I think too, as consumers, we're all, wow, subscription software. No, no, that, you know, we don't want to do that. But from a business standpoint, if you're selling value, it's there and uh, it's going to be a lot more sustainable. And in, in a way too, it's just better for them. It's healthier, right? We've all had those apps we loved. We paid for one time and they shut down or got acquired by Google because they weren't making any money. Exactly. And so, um, so in your case too, I'm assuming all of your first customers really came from the fact that you had the open source and they were already using it or familiar with it. And so it was almost its own built in sales tool. Yeah, I don't bother with other channels. I'm not taking out ads in info world or trying to talk to CIOs or CTOs, right? My customers are the Ruby developers, the open source developers who want the best tool for this problem. Mm -hmm. And they will go to their bosses or they will pull out their company card and buy it. Yeah. And so, you know, I, it's going to be hard selling, <laughs> making six figure deals. Uh, if you're, if you're talking to developers yeah. and not CTOs, but you know, as a one person company, I don't need those six figure deals. Yep. I'm not Oracle. I don't want to be Oracle. Um, I, I, I can keep my, my expenses down and low and keep my costs down so that individual developers can justify this to their boss. Yeah, absolutely. And so the ad, the last question is just of everything that you've learned and that you're doing, what is it every day that kind of is the, is the most, brings you the most joy is the most fun part about what you're doing. Um, that kind of helps keep you renewed in the face of kind of the never ending March of improving software. So there's two things that, that I love about what I've done over the last four years. One is that I've built this system that, hundreds and thousands of companies around the world depend on and love and and people just you know people email me and say thank you for sidekick it's amazing it's awesome we love it uh, we depend on it so much at, at our job that's really that's really fulfilling and of course the fact that i'm making a, a great living at it um, is all the more fulfilling uh, the other thing is is that um i don't have to spend 40 hours a week building somebody else's dream i i can spend uh I can take time out of my day to do podcasts and interviews like this. I don't yeah. have to worry about uh, spending eight hours a day working on 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 coding some random little feature that a PM wanted. It's yeah. not, you know, I don't have to do that. I don't have to do that uh, that sort of feature treadmill as part of my job anymore. Uh, that and that gives me the chance to uh, take my kid to school, pick him up from school. I can work whatever hours I want. So mm-hmm. having the lifestyle flexibility is amazing. It's awesome. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, that's really all I've got. Uh, question wise, is there anything else that came to mind, uh, through the course of this that would be good to chat about, or you feel like got pretty good coverage here? Um, I mean, I think my, my overall sort of business, what I've tried to do with my business over the last few years is, is minimize my risk. 
And I, and I think that's sort of uh, a theme that maybe maybe your readers and your listeners could could benef- benefit from is, is, you know, I started this business with very little risk. I didn't invest any money. It was just a few hours, nights and evenings and weekends. And and so many people just sort of take this big leap where they think I'm I'm just going to I'm going to make a killing. I'm going to make this leap and make a killing and and be successful. And it's so much easier and so much uh, nicer when you don't have to take that risk, when you don't have to take that leap, when you don't have to take funding and uh, find investors and, and split your attention that way. Right. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I kept my, my expenses really low, um, and, and doing all that minimized my risk and really allowed me to build the business slowly over, over several years. And, uh, and, and ultimately that's, that's the way to, to, uh, assure yourself of the best chance of building a successful business is giving yourself plenty of runway. And there's so many, the, the news tech crunch and, you know, all these, you hear all these stories, right? The things that rise to the top of hacker news are the, I did this big dramatic, I quit my job and, you know, and, and then it kind of perpetuates that myth that that's how it works rather than that's one of those times that it happened to work because nobody's upvoting all the times that it didn't work. Right. Exactly. Um, So slow and kind of slow and steady wins the race type of deal is really the, the story. Yeah. I mean, I think. You, you always hear about the, the overnight success band that's been playing together for 10 years, right? Yeah. Uh, and, you know, my business, I've been doing this for four years, grinding every single day. I'm on my email, answering support emails every single day for the last four years. Mm-hmm. And, and so it wasn't overnight. I've been building this for, for many years now. Yep. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's not going to be a matter of we're going to go from zero to $100,000 a month in revenue in six months you're much more likely to be able to build that over four or five years. Yeah. And if you keep, if you minimize your risk, if you keep your expenses way down, then you've got so much more, uh, runway and, and you know, so much more likelihood of, of making that work. Yeah. I've literally got a chapter in the book about that. Just trying to minimize yeah. your personal costs and you give yourself a lot more runway, a lot more time. Exactly. So, all right. Well, that's, this is awesome. I really appreciate it. Uh, thanks for taking the time to do this and, sure uh, yeah, I'll include all the links in the show notes, uh, I guess show notes, interview notes, and, uh, have it up here, uh, once we get it transcribed. So, all right. Thanks. Perfect. Nice chatting with you.